Productive Pastor 12, How I Am Moving. Welcome back, friends. So 12, summer season. It's kind of weird not being on some hyper-focused strategic series of conversations, but as I talked about in the last little interlude, like what's going on the summer episode, there's a lot of really cool stuff that's going on. I'm stoked to be 100% honest with you. I'm having to like stay focused on getting like things done in the way they should be done because there's a lot of really super fun conversations about all these things going on this summer. But today, I want to talk about how I am moving. And it seems kind of like, that seems weird a little bit, but as I explained it in the last uh, episode, there's some pretty major shifts and shapes and changes. And so I want to talk about how I'm being strategic about my productivity inside of all that. Then also, I want to talk about something that's unique to a certain segment of listeners uh, but it's a pretty major segment of listeners, and uh, I, I just think it's a good conversation for us to have, especially at this time of the year. And so before we jump into all of that, just really want to just kind of put three things in front of you, easy, quick stuff. Number one, if you've not done the Season 1 survey, this is the last time you will hear from me about that, but we're we're finding out so much about what people are looking for in the future off of that. So... The link to that will be in the show notes, revchadbrooks.com slash PPP slash 012. Uh, I would appreciate you going and taking that. It will also be in the notes wherever you're listening to this podcast as well. So you can just kind of click on that link. Second thing is, you know, revchadbrooks.com is where everything is at. I'm writing a lot more these days, and I'm writing about general productivity stuff and a few other things as I'm kind of part of all of this. And so I'd appreciate just to go over there and check that out. And the last thing is this, the Productive Pastor community on Facebook. Uh, I like to call it the Productivity Party. And I would love to see you come and hang out and just hit up all of those spaces, all of those things. Be part of that conversation. And so uh, let's go ahead and just jump into the main conversation point today. Uh, how am I moving? Now, before we jump into that, I think the first thing we need to talk about because I realized for all of us United Methodists, this idea of pastors moving, maybe with the level of that I'm about to talk about it or others talk about it, it can seem kind of foreign. My dad's a Southern Baptist pastor. Every time I bring up our system, I mean, it's been 15 years and I still have to re-explain it to him. Uh, and it's just, it's a different thing. So if you're, if you are United Methodist, you realize this is the time of the year all the pastors are moving. And if you're not United Methodist, you might really be kind of confused. So a 30-second version of this is, in the United Methodist Church, there's an annual conference. That's the region that you are a pastor inside of. That conference has a bishop, and that bishop has a group of leaders around them that's called the cabinet. And uh, every year, starting around in January, they start looking at who's retiring, who's requesting a move, who needs to move, all these sorts of things. And pastors can request this, and churches can request this. And so they begin thinking, hopefully, strategically, about who's going to go where. But the kind of wild thing is everybody moves within the same couple of days. And I'm a weird man out here because I, I kind of cashed in a lot of stuff and uh, <laughs> of like renewal leave and vacation, that kind of stuff, and, and went a little bit early. But I just finished annual conference this past weekend, and so you're in the season now where most Methodist pastors are moving. So if you're not United Methodist, it's kind of a quick version of, of where that comes from. And, you know, Methodist pastors tend to move more than other uh, denominations. And so we've got a way we think about this. But I think that there's pieces of this conversation today that are important no matter where you are in leadership. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But I also think that there's some things that when we move – in ministry that we can be aware of that there is a unique liminal space inside of that that can be taken advantage of and it should be taking advantage of um, as you're part of that transition. So really today our conversation like how am I moving is going to boil down to two sub-conversations. How am I moving from an emotional level but then also, how am I moving in a tactical level? 
Uh, and so those are two things. We're going to start off with that emotional level. So how am I moving emotionally? And that, that might seem kind of weird to even say that, but, but this is the thing. And you might not even think that it, it matters so much as an individual pastor, but this morning I was kind of pre-thinking through this content in the shower, and I realized this. As pastors, we kind of, we're supposed to be mo- talking about growth, and if we're talking about growth and change and transformation and all of those sorts of things, shouldn't we be modeling growth as well? And I think that if we struggle to grow personally, even in a private way, um, if we struggle there, we're going to struggle to publicly talk about growth whatsoever at all. And I think especially, and sometimes in ministry, there's this idea, this temptation for us to remain just absolutely stoic and unchanging. Like I realize Friedman's language of a non-anxious presence is a real thing, all of that. But like if we're just concrete walls we're going to create concrete wall disciples. You know, if we are a wall, what we're pretty much saying is that it's okay to never go through life with tough changes or with any sort of emotional reflection. So that sounds just just kind of weird, but we have to state that. And I feel like whenever we're transitioning in leadership, that that is a, that is a remarkably short and highly focused time for us to think about this sort of thing, to think about uh, this sort of change, this transformation, all of that. And I went through, I'm in the middle right now, and I'm not done with it, of, of, of making this just kind of big, huge, couple-page plan for what ministry looks like for me for the second half of my career uh, that sort of thing, and I'm asking a lot of appreciative questions, some 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 tough things there, but because I want to grow, because I want to be better, because I also realize this kind of weird liminal season that I am in. And so, you know, there's a couple of questions I'm thinking about, and then I, what I want to do is just kind of go through uh, some questions that you might want to reflect on if you're moving, or if you're not moving, you're not transitioning. I honestly still think that you know this is some good questions to ask. I will have these questions over at the show notes, revchatbrooks.com slash PPP slash 012. But really what this is, is this is me thinking deeply about what is my personal responsibility as a leader? What is my personal responsibility as a pastor? Because I think in many ways, those two terms are not necessarily co-aligned, but we have to think about both of them. But I've been thinking about responsibility, personal responsibility a lot, but I've also been thinking about agency and those sorts of things with what's going on. And so like the first question that I asked myself, and I spent some time just with a notebook uh, over a cup of coffee, was this, you know, what are my basic assumptions about how I pastor? So I thought back of the last 15 years of formal pastoring and then you know, additional five, seven years before that of being in vocational ministry in different capacities. But thinking back about, you know, every single thing that I've done, that I've learned, that I've known, that I've been, that I've tried, all this kind of stuff. And I really started beginning to just build out some basic assumptions. You almost can think of these as a core value. And so in many ways, imagine that we're making an inverted triangle right now to where we're living heavily in theory land, and by the time we get to the end of these questions, we're going to find ourselves dwelling in action land. So think about it that way. Like, what are the basic assumptions about how I pastor? And I actually, like, I wrote down all these things, and I went back earlier this morning, and I spent, I think I answered these questions, I mean, four pages to answer these questions uh, of just sitting there and journaling and thinking and writing about it. But I came up with a couple of stuff. One of the things I've learned is, you know, no matter what, this is, means to be, this is wide birth kind of stuff, that I deeply care about biblical literacy in my ministry. Uh, I don't talk about that this much on this podcast because I'm trying to be pretty focused on productive past. But if you, if you hang out with me on YouTube, you realize I just make tons of videos about the Bible. And also looking back to my teaching style, the other things, the things I'm passionate about, the conversations I find myself in, all this, I realize that, you know, one of my deep just kind of convictions and core values is about developing biblical literacy in folks. Another one of the things that's a core value for me is just the importance of spiritual formation and personal devotion. So I know those are huge and massive big things. You know, another part of my basic assumptions and my kind of core value with the way I pastor 
is I try to be deeply strategic. And if you're a listener to the podcast, that does not surprise you, you know, whatsoever at all. So I sat down and I thought about these. I kind of bullet pointed out some descriptions, some thoughts, some phrases, that sort of thing. So we're at the top of that inverted pyramid living completely in theory land. We go down a step further and I ask myself this question, what lessons have I learned over the last 10, 12 years? What are the positive lessons that I've learned? Also, what are the negative lessons that I have learned. And then, you know, like yet again, I'm making bullet points of all of these sorts of things and letting it get as hyper particular as I feel like it needs to be in that moment. Uh, and so I thought deeply about these lessons I've learned and I caught myself at a moment uh, because like, you know, my transition right now is from being a full-time pastor of an eight-year-old church plant that grew rapidly prior to covid that built buildings, that merged with another church, just all sorts of things. And now I'm going to being a bivocational pastor where I serve two small country churches, quarter time, more Methodist language for not that much at all. And my full-time job is developing other leaders and and working for a a company, being one of their content developers in ministry. Um, And so there's a lot of transitions I've learned, but I'm driving out to one of these churches a couple of weeks ago, and I, I, I've not known it. I don't know the town. I don't know anything. The only thing I know is they're a smaller church, and the folks there are older than I am. And I, my mind went to a, a rough spot in leadership and ministry over the last four or five years, and I found myself becoming increasingly anxious over the situation because I just automatically assumed small rural church, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be the same just like stuff that I had to deal with, which really led to incredible burnout and depression. And then I realized that, Chad, that's silly. You're being silly. The only person that can recreate that scenario in this new place, these new people, is you, is if you bring in some of these same things. And so when I thought back about what I've learned in a positive way and a negative way, I really kind of drilled deep into that situation. So if you're in a leadership transition mode and you have a, a level of anxiety about it, you know, I would suggest you go into and think about the positives and negatives as it relates to that anxiety. And remember, this is about personal responsibility and agency. You know, you can't control other people, but you can control yourself. And just make some bullet point lists of the lessons you've learned, positive and negative. And I'll tell you all what, y'all, my negative list was about 20 bullet points deep. And that's okay. Like, it's going to look like that in life sometimes. But I said, these are lessons I've learned. And if it's a lesson you've learned, it's something you reflected on that you realize that you want to change and that sort of thing. And so we kind of uh, continue down the the pyramid uh, out of theory land, moving more towards the action land. And so I think about this. What do both health and effectiveness look like? Uh, How do the core convictions and lessons that you have learned lead to a healthy vocation, a a healthy vocational vision and church effectiveness? And this is what's interesting. This is where those values you bring in are going to meld and melt with those lessons, both positive and negative you've learned. And then the conversations that you have is, is part of this transition about what expectations are there what responsibilities are there uh, that's going to move into these sorts of things where you kind of start building out this level of preferred future. There's also the space of boundaries there. Like, what are you going to draw lines around? What are you going to defend? And here's the thing. The boundaries conversation is tough because I have seen people abuse the language of boundaries. But really and truly, this is not about you defending time, this kind of stuff. But think about it on these lines. What do I know is so vitally important? I need to protect it and care for it, you know, super intentionally. This is about you realizing this is what I bring to the table, and I'm going to defend what I bring to the table against these things that I know I just don't bring to the table. And so just these boundary conversations, what am I going to draw myself around? And so all of this thoughts about health and effectiveness This is going to come together to realize, okay, this is what this preferred future, this is what this new season can look like that's drawing on all of the wealth of experience you have throughout your your whole life. Uh, So part of that is what will I say yes to and what will I say no to? And this is the thing. 
I realized this as I was kind of part of it because I actually had to do this already. Like before I even start working at the church, what will I say yes to and what will I say no to? And and you're going to be have to one that's going to have to like define out what that looks like for you. But this is what I realized. You know, one of those lessons that I have learned has been that I typically will say yes to things too much too quickly. Um, I've learned negative lessons about that in, in all sorts of ways, but I've already encountered a situation where they said, hey, we, we're having a problem with this. And in a previous time in my life, I would have jumped and said, oh, I can fix that in like 20 minutes. I'll take care of that. But what I realize right now, especially in this ministry situation, that one of the things I'm being consciously intentional about developing a skill that I need to develop is learning how do I empower the congregation to do the things that are extremely important to it. Because here's the thing, when we choose to not bring things into the situation, what we're choosing is, is we've reflected, we've learned the lessons of, you know, what are the things that have plagued me for a long time? Like, if you keep having the same problem show up in multiple situations and scenarios and even places in ministry, I would reckon to say the person that's always responsible for that always being an issue is not the people you're with but it's something that you you've got going on and you know who can stop that there's only one of them it's you and so i learned like okay i've got to model this and realize this is important enough where yes i could fix this in 15 or 20 minutes it was a sound system issue i said no okay we need to call this person get them to come and do this because i know that one of these kind of focused areas moving into this next situation is congregational empowerment because i know I'm going to be here for a season and they will be around, you know, after that. And so these are some of the the emotional ways I'm moving towards. And here's the thing, y'all, I'm doing all of this work before this is started because I know that when things get going, I want to have a well-crafted idea of, of what I feel like this should look like. And if I don't do this beforehand, I'm not going to be able to adapt it and deal with it on the fly because I know that has happened. And so it's like we're, we're, we've come from the very top of theory land. We're moving down to the bottom, uh, the middle of our triangle, and it was, was fixed into action land. And we'll talk about kind of more of this, this tactical side of things because this is it. I think the first thing that I know I'm planning on doing, and this is where this, this lesson is going to be um, just – uh, hyper focused to what I'm thinking about uniquely in this moment right now. First thing I do, I, I want to learn the community. These are two very small towns. One's 5,000, one's like 15,000. And so I'm doing some pre work before this. I know I, I, I'm, I'm doing some Googling around. I'm seeing if I can find Facebook groups or Facebook pages about these areas. Uh, you know, not necessarily the swap and sell sites, but the rants and rave sites. If you can find one of those, I found them. I'm learning about that. I also, I have access to Mission Insight, which is a pretty powerful database uh, program. I've been running really, really deep Mission Insight reports and just doing some research in there and asking myself the questions, how might COVID have changed these things? I'm trying to get as much of an understanding about this before I, before I get there. Because I know when I get there, one of the most important things to me is about meeting key leaders. And so meeting the key leaders in the community meeting the key leaders in the churches. One of the churches shares a parking lot with the city hall. And so I know there's a very good intimate connection right there. And so I, I'm planning on going kind of you know heavy into this. The second thing I have noticed is, it, I think regardless the size of the church and the post-COVID reality, communication systems are absolutely key. If you hung around Productive Pastor for a while, you might remember the database course I ran a few years ago. Neither of these churches has a healthy functioning database, and that's kind of one of my my summer projects is to build that out from scratch for the sake of communication. Uh, I think communication is going to be just this absolute priority in those spaces because I'm also the first pastor that one of these churches does not have living in the town in the parsonage. So I know communication is going to be absolutely critical. So one of the things I am drawing a boundary around is I'm going to defend and make sure I can communicate well to these congregations because it's multi, it's two different churches, and they're very different. So that's the kind of the community piece and the communication piece. The next thing I'm doing is I'm just going to preach the lectionary for at least the first couple of months. 
And that way that I can just begin building up a foundation with, with these, with these, these folks, but I'm also being able to spend the time more time with them. I'm prioritizing the small amount of time I have to be able to be face to face. And so if I'm preaching lectionary, that removes a level of sermon preparation that I would be doing. Otherwise I'm not doing series design here. Uh, and I'm not, if I, I might, I might say in the lectionary for a very, very long time. Um, but I'm, I'm deciding just to preach the lectionary so that I can focus on relationships some more. Uh, the next thing is this, there's the bottom line boundaries that I am setting. And I talked about this earlier, but this is kind of that bottom line boundary. This is the, 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 the question I'm asking myself as I make decisions inside of all of this. Will this empower other people? That's the first question. The second one is, is this contextually realistic? I'm moving from a larger church in a city full of young folks that are very technical oriented or very digital savvy, this whole nine yards into communities where there might still not be broadband access. You know, I always thought there's a Jurassic Park rule. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And I'm really asking myself those two questions. Will this empower others? And the second one is, is this contextually realistic? So I had a big, huge, interesting time thinking through this. And I'll tell you what, it was personally extremely clarifying. And so if you find this interesting, I'd encourage you to go over to revchatbrooks.com slash PPP slash 012 to just get those questions about what that looks like. Uh, because, you know, being part of this productivity community is not necessarily about just getting more things done Hopefully you caught that over the course of the last year as we've been moving and sharing and changing things. But what it's really about is, am I living out this call in a way that is the healthiest for me and the healthiest for the church? Because I feel like when pastors are healthy, churches are going to be healthy as well. And so there's this peak right there into my mind of what's been going on. Now, I still have a week and a half before I get there. And I've got some some stuff. I've got lists. I've got those sorts of things. But I'm telling you, what I'm banking on is this that work of personal responsibility and agency. Because here's the thing. All of those things that I did about those lessons I've learned, the positives, the negatives, that sort of stuff, those are informing action land. Those are informing the action steps that I have. And so this was a theme earlier this year. It's still a current theme now. I just, I cannot implore the idea of personal awareness and ministry to you enough. So thanks for listening in on this episode, hanging out. Love to see the Productive Pastor community on Facebook. You know, cool stuff's going on. Tons of fun people there hanging out, interacting. But thanks so much for hearing. I'd, I'd love to hear back from you what you thought about this. You know, you can hit me up on all the socials at Rev Chad Brooks. Uh, thanks so much for being such a cool part of this community. And the last thing I want to talk about is this. This has come out on the survey. We're hearing from this. One of the things is, what would you like to see? You know, part of what I am doing now is working with pastors and with churches on one-on-one levels. And then also doing a little bit of things with their uh, teams, their board, that sort of thing. Now, if you're interested in what one-on-one work might look like, I would love to hear from you. And you can hit me up at revchadbrooks at gmail.com. I've got uh, some openings that are still for the rest of the summer going into the fall. And if these are things that you really want to focus and drill down on more in a personal level, a one-on-one level, the high level of accountability with the level of work, I would love to hang out with you and be part of that journey with you. But until next week, I'm Chad Brooks. This is Productive Pastor. Thanks for being awesome. Isn't this a fun place to be? See you back in the next episode.